Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for listening and joining in. My name is Katrina. I'll be presenting your DERM lecture today. Um, I'm a final year medical student at the moment on a dermatology placement. Um, last year, I did a BMED Sci in melanoma, and I also presented the dermatology revision lectures last year. So I've been able to refine some slides and make sure that they're still up to date uh, so that I can teach up to date stuff for you guys. If you have any questions, don't be afraid to just unmute and uh, throw it in. I will be checking the chat as well and answering as we go. Um, the structure for this lecture will be, I'll be covering main conditions, the high yield ones that usually come up on exams and that will most often be tested. There will be a few conditions that I'll skip over and leave for you to read in your own time, uh, just because lots to do, little time. Um, let's get into it. So here's my email address as well. If you have any questions, feel free to uh, send me an email. Essentially, I'll quickly just say the best way to study for DERM is really pictures. DERMnet is the best place to go for Australian based info and exams will be based typically off of DERMnet. OSCEs, we did have an, when I was in third year, I did have an OSCE station um, in DERM. It was actually on melanoma and how to describe a lesion and what the management was. So it can pop up and there will always be a written question at least on DERM. And I'll be going over a few of these that popped up um, at the end of this session so that we can talk through uh, how you would answer it and why. Derm history, I'll leave for you to read, but a quick anatomy uh, revision. Essentially the skin, three main parts. Um, you have the top layer, which is your epidermis. Uh, the second layer is your dermis and the bottom layer is your fatty layer. This is important to remember because the way conditions present depends on where it's originating from. So from the epidermis, it's mainly going to be presenting as secondary changes. So things like scars, atrophy, erosions, and scales will be because of something in the epidermis. In the dermis, it will be because of a primary change. So it will typically present well demarcated. And what this means is the pathology or the skin that's affected you can definitely draw a line from affected skin to normal skin. And it's very clear. So it's well circumscribed. And these are things like a blister, um, a nodule, a fluid filled blister, essentially. Um, subcutaneous tissue. This presents differently from that in the dermis because it is not well demarcated and it's usually diffuse. So it's things like urticaria, where you can't really tell where the wheel starts and where the normal skin ends. The treatment principles for derm uh, can be broken down into these four main steps. Firstly, uh, lifestyle management, then topical therapy, UV if applicable, and finally systemics. So, uh, okay, describing lesions. I'll quickly cover this just so that we can understand the conditions I'll go through in a second. A macule, flat lesion, small, a patch, larger flat lesion. Papule, small raised lesion, and a plaque is a larger raised lesion. Um, vesicles are fluid filled lesions and they're less than half a centimeters and bullae are the same things, but just larger. Nodules are solid round uh, ellipsoids and they're dermal in origin. So you can definitely tell where the nodule starts and where it ends. And a pustule is essentially a vesicle containing purulent material. These are the topics that I'll be covering. And at the end, we'll go through questions. So skin tumors, so common, and you really have to be on top of them because they will absolutely come up on exams. Um, starting with actinic keratoses. So actinic keratoses are essentially sun damaged skin. They're scaly uh, patches or plaques, and they're typically seen in elderly patients who are Caucasian, fair skin, and had a lot of sun exposure when they were younger. Your management for actinic keratoses, which are also known as solar keratoses, will be cryotherapy and liquid nitrogen. For patients with lots of solar keratoses, maybe over their face, you can also opt for topical chemotherapies, such as topical 5-fluorouracil and topical imiquimod. Um, these are just applied over the entire areas for about three to six weeks um, and they cause regression in these cells. 
always, always harp on about prevention. Um, actinic keratoses are damaged cells, but essentially they're not cancer. So management should also include reassuring the patient, telling them that's very low risk of malignant transformation to an SCC. Um, this is what actinic keratoses look like. So they're scaly patches, plaques. They can be multiple over sun exposed areas. Uh, they can be a range of different colors um, and they can also be slightly tender on palpation. Most of the times they will remit spontaneously with a few of them progressing to Bowen's disease. So Bowen's disease is the next step up from actinic keratosis. And the way to remember it is on a spectrum of actinic keratosis to SCC, it goes actinic keratosis, Bowen's, which is SCC in situ, and then SCC. So Bowen's is SCC in situ, and that means it hasn't invaded through the basement membrane. Okay, uh, basement membrane, uh, basement layer. Um, same risk factors as actinic keratosis, but it has been linked with HPV infections. Uh, so too are SECs. Um, essentially what they present is irregular, scaly red plaques. They typically have well-defined borders, which differentiates it from invasive SECs. They grow slowly over time, whereas actinic keratosis typically stay the same size and regress spontaneously. Um, and they are found in sun exposed areas. Um, they can be very large. They can be actually up to a few, several centimeters in diameters. Uh, so just keep an eye out for them because some of these can transform into SCCs. The treatment of Bowen's in no particular order. For smaller ones, you can just cryotherapy them, but typically you would be applying topical chemotherapy to prevent it from um, transitioning into anything more malignant. 5% of Bowen's will uh, evolve into SCCs. So patients with lots of Bowen's, you should probably regularly follow them up um, just to make sure that they don't reappear or nothing has progressed. SCCs. So these are the second most common uh, skin cancers. They account for about 70% of the non-melanoma skin cancers. Uh, sorry, 30% of the non-melanoma skin cancers second to BCCs. Uh, they have similar risk factors to AKs and Bowen's in that age, sex, elderly men, white men, um, people with a history of sun damage and blistering sunburns associated with HPV infections, as well as arsenic exposure. Um, your management for practically all suspicious lesions of cancer should be excision, okay? For very, very, very small, low risk tumors, you can cryo, but exam response should be, you want to surgically excise it. Um, this is what SECs look like now. So um, you can tell that there's erythema spreading around it. The borders are not as well-defined and not as regular as Bowen's or actinic keratosis, signs of ulceration and crusting um, are also signs of malignancy. And if it's raised, scaly and lumpy on a sun exposed area, you must have a low threshold to cut it out. This is a picture I wanted to include. So it's relevant to the Bowen's and the actinic keratosis. Essentially, when we're talking about applying topical chemotherapy, so this lady has um, a few AKs and Bowen's, and she was prescribed Effudex, which is um, 5 fluorouracil The reaction is actually like this and tell them that they should expect a very bright tomato-like face and they should keep applying the topical chemo for about three to six weeks because then it will eventually lead to this type of skin. Um, this is just out of interest sake because when I first saw it, I was very shocked. Um, going on a bit more about SCCs and the different subtypes you might hear about. So... Um, cutaneous horns are sort of a subtype of SCCs in that they are a more a morphological presentation. They can present when uh, in, they can present if you have an actinic keratosis, a Bowen's, or an SCC. So they can be a feature of any one of these conditions. So whenever you see one, you practically will always cut it out and then diagnose on pathology. A keratoacanthoma is something you're more likely to hear in pathology and on your path exam because it has very uh, characteristic features. 
So essentially they are rapidly growing nodules. They, the, the buzzwords are that they have a smooth outer dome and a central keratotic plug. So when you remove that plug, you're left with a crater. Um, you still wanna chop this off and diagnose on path. Basal cell carcinomas. Now, these are the most common non-melanoma skin cancers you will see, you'll practically see one always. 70% um, of the non-melanoma skin cancers, very, very, very rarely will they be a threat to life. Only a tiny proportion rapidly grow and invade deep or metastasize. Similar risk factors in terms of UV exposure, but they're also associated with some inherited uh, BCC conditions, particularly Gorlin syndrome, where patients present with many, many BCCs due to a genetic defect. Uh, clinical features, I'll go over in the next slide, but your management will be with any skin cancer to remove it. Aggressive therapy for smaller ones, only if it's metastasized will you be considering chemo radiotherapy. Um, last year, I had a question about why would you still cut it out if it's so low chance of uh, you know evolving into something malignant? And the reason for this is that BCCs can continue to grow and encompass um, large areas of a patient's skin. And they have the tendency to ulcerate and permanently damage the skin and surrounding tissues. So although it won't metastasize or has a low risk of metastasizing and you know great long-term outcome, even if you don't cut it off, essentially the local destruction caused by the BCC is more risky than just cutting it out. Um, moving on to the subtypes. So you really should know these three main subtypes. The first is called a nodular BCC. And this is the most common type on the face. And it's the most common type that the buzzwords apply to in terms of when you stretch out the skin, you'll see a typical pearly rolled up border. And I'm not sure if you can tell, but with the eye of faith, you might be able to see arborizing telangiectasias. And all arborizing means is that it looks like tree-like structures. They're just linear wavy telangiectasias. This is the nodular BCC. Superficial BCCs are more common in young adults and more common over the trunk and limbs. Uh, they actually can look a lot like SCCs. They're typically flat plaques, well-defined. They will still have telangiectasias over them, which is probably the main differentiating factor, although they can be dry and scaly. These are more likely to ulcerate as well. Infiltrating or morphaeiform BCCs are most usually found mid-face over the nose, and they're very hard to pick up actually because they look just like scars. And this is the BCC here. It's a waxy scar, like it's essentially dent in the middle of a person's face with indistinct borders. So always take a thorough history and pay attention to when patients say this part of the skin looks different because it could actually be uh, an infiltrating morphaeiform BCC. It's also much more aggressive than the other BCC subtypes. Melanoma, so this is what my BMED's eye was based on, so please ask questions. Um, essentially, you, you probably already know this, but it's malignant transformation of melanocytes. Uh, only accounts for 5% of all skin cancers, but accounts for 70% of skin cancer deaths. Australia and New Zealand have the highest rates of melanoma in the world, something like 11 times greater than the average of the rest of the worldwide uh, incidence rate. Um, and melanoma is associated with certain risk factors. So yes, UV exposure, but you should also ask, did they ever have blistering sunburns as a child? Did they play outdoors or work outdoors? Family history of melanoma or any skin cancer, personal history of melanoma, any skin cancer, skin phototypes are one and two, meaning that they have fair skin, blue eyes, blonde hair, red hair, lots of freckles. Patients who are immunosuppressed are also more likely to develop melanoma. And this clinical feature list I have is really important to remember because this was essentially my entire um, OSCE exam. You just list off these things, tick the boxes or not. Um, so A, B, C, D, E, F, G, asymmetry, border irregularity, color variegation, meaning it's not one homogenous color. It could be a mixture of red, black areas of white showing regression. That's a worrying sign. Diameter greater than six millimeters, or if the patient is telling you that a lesion is evolving, okay? Mm -hmm. Firm and growing are also signs uh, for concern. The first thing you wanna do is look at this lesion under dermoscopy and it has a specific demoscopic features. 
Um, but essentially management, oh no, melanoma subtypes. So let's go through the subtypes. SSMs or superficial spreading melanomas are the most common melanomas. They're about 66% of all melanomas, typically middle-aged men on sun exposed area. And you've got to remember that about 40 to 50% of them can arise in pre-existing moles. So if you, what you want to do is patients who are very moly, you want to ask them to keep track of them and do regular self-skin examinations. The current ABCD tool most applies to superficial spreading melanoma. And this is important because as you'll notice in nodular melanoma, the ABCD rule actually doesn't apply. These type are the second most common melanomas uh, and they differ because they typically present as a single colored, typically blue or black, uniformly dome shaped nodule which can become polypoid, ulcerated, or bleed. And they are the most aggressive subtype of melanoma. So for these types of patients, they will present with a rapidly growing nodule. And the second they say that you have to have a low threshold to chop it off and cut it out. Lentigomaligna melanomas. So you might've heard of lentigomaligna and lentigomaligna melanoma. Essentially lentigomaligna is the in situ phase of lentigomaligna melanoma. LMMs, can stay in the in situ phase for decades. And this subtype can be in its in situ phase with essentially zero or very low implications for long-term prognosis. So it could be an in situ phase and they could still have really great 10 year mortalities. They will typically present over the face as large patchy areas and their very slow progression to malignancy compared to nodular melanomas, which can arise in months and be invasive within months. The final subtype to remember is acral lentiginous melanoma. And this is most common in Asians and people of color. And these present over the palms, soles, nails, um, and fingers of patients. And if it involves the nail matrix, it's called a subungal melanoma. This is only about 5% of melanomas and this is about 10, whereas this is about 20. So the management for melanoma is important to remember, particularly the order and why we do it. Whenever you see a suspicious lesion, you wanna do an excisional biopsy, okay? If you're worried about melanoma, you must try to at least cut it all out. The reason you wanna cut it all out is because once you have the sample, the pathologist can actually measure how thick the tumor is from the top of the epidermis until they find the last melanocyte. That gives you the Breslow thickness of the melanoma. When you know the Breslow thickness of the melanoma from the excisional biopsy, this will guide your wide local excision. So your wide local excision is a second surgery that happens. And this is essentially to ensure that there is a safety margin around the melanoma, where the melanoma was. Uh, thinner melanomas will have smaller margins. Thicker melanomas will have larger margins. That makes sense. If you don't cut everything out on your original biopsy, your Breslow thickness is likely to be inaccurate. And therefore your wide local excision might not be as wide as it should be, particularly if it's on the border of inside of, you know, one to one to two centimeters. Any tumor that is greater than one millimeters in thickness will have a sentinel node biopsy conducted as well to see whether the melanoma has spread. For those that have metastasized, you will also then consider adjuvant chemotherapy. And for all patients, um, less commonly for in situ, but for all invasive tumors, they will require regular follow-up and self-skin examinations for at least 10 years. The thickness of the tumor is associated with long-term prognosis. It's the strongest significant uh, indicator. And so for thinner tumors, you have a, almost 100% 10 year survival, whereas for thick tumors, you have about 75% 10 year survival. Um, differentials for melanomas, Seborrheic keratoses are the most common differential and you'll definitely see them in any old person, essentially. They are flat or raised papules or plaques. They're very smooth and they, when you actually feel them, they feel waxy and warty. And they have a stuck on appearance like you stuck glue tack onto somebody's back. We actually had a question at the end of fourth year where it was just a picture of an old lady's back with heaps of seborrheic keratoses and you just had to diagnose what it was. These are harmless. You can just leave them there and they won't do anything unless patients are really, really worried about them. You can chop them off. Um, 
Benign melanocytic lesions, essentially nevi, these are just flat moles and they differ from mel melanomas because they have a uniform color. Sololin tigers are proliferation of melanocytes and they also present like flat moles. Um, they're well circumscribed, single uniform color as well. Atypical nevi uh, are ones that could trip you up. And these are the ones that you typically would cut out anyway because they present with color variation, irregular borders. They can be slightly raised as well. They are essentially benign, but the clinical features can clinical features can be concerning, so you can still cut them off. Other differentials include a pigmented BCC, a pyogenic granuloma, which is essentially a blood blister that rapidly evolves after minor trauma, SCCs um, and trauma or hemorrhage, particularly of the nails, can look a bit like melanoma. So takeaway, BCCs bleed. They have telangiectasias, so they bleed. SCCs are scaly, and melanomas metastasize. Uh, any questions so far? No? Great. So inflammatory derm now. Um, there are lots of different conditions under dermatitis, which is inflammation of the skin. They can be endogenous or ex 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 exogenous, and I've broken it down here. The ones in red, I I will cover the ones in black. I would suggest you look up um, for your own learning, um, not as in depth, but just so you at least know what they are to identify them. Uh, eczema, I'm sure lots of you already know this from third year. I'll quickly run over it because it's a, it can be a very large station. Um, eczema is essentially acute, subacute or chronic inflammation of the skin um, due to a loss of the filaggrin protein. Loss of this protein leads to less oils in the skin, less oils means more transepidermal water loss leading to dry skin, which is the hallmark of eczema. Um, most commonly seen in kids, can occur in any age and it's part of the atopic triad, uh, hay fever, asthma, eczema. You must remember triggers in case this is an oscillation so you can advise on management. And essentially you can have anything that heats up the body will dry out the skin. So um, hot waters, you know, wearing lots and lots of layers, particularly of wool and synthetic fibers. And particularly when you take off the clothing, that's when it can uh, trigger itchiness. Aero, allergens, dust mites, pollens, and stress can also flare up eczema. Your investigations will typically be uh, are done on a clinical basis, but you can consider allergy testing just to rule that out as well. If you're concerned about secondary infections, swab the skin. This is what uh, eczema looks like. So uh, patients will present with episodic itchiness, patchy, uh, dry, erythematous, poorly defined rashes, as you can see over this baby's cheeks and chin. And they typically present over the flexural surfaces, uh, so elbows and knees. As you can see in this picture, there are signs of excoriations, like here, meaning scratching and lichenification, meaning the skin looks thickened and there are accentuated skin markings. Uh, signs of infections, you will see potentially pustules and crusting. The management for eczema, I've written down everything. I'll quickly summarize it, but just know everything essentially. Um, in terms of lifestyle, you can uh, advise patients to use soap-free washes. They're less irritating to the skin. Avoid triggers um, and oatmeal baths can also be helpful. In terms of topicals, moisturizers and emollients are the mainstay of treatment, no matter the severity. They must continue to moisturize their skin even when flare-ups seem to subside. This is just to prevent recurrences. If moisturizers alone aren't helpful, you can consider adding on topical steroids. So in flare-ups, you want to use a potent steroid such as betamethasone or methylprednisolone. If uh, for longer term, you can consider using weaker steroids such as hydrocortisone, which can actually be bought over the counter. The choice of the steroid will depend on the age of the patient, the site and the severity. So obviously for little babies, you don't wanna be using super potent steroids over their face and eyelids. Um, what you want to do is you want to treat the areas until they've completely resolved because recurrence is most common for people who under treat. 
On top of all of the topicals, also suggest wet dressings, which is what they do in hospital actually for every single patient, regardless of severity. And this is just a damp cloth, a tubular cloth applied over the areas. And this helps increase the penetration of these ointments um, and medications. If you're concerned about infection, swab, treat for the infection. And systemic, so antihistamines, particularly at night, if they're uh, complaining of great itch. UV therapy for chronic patients is very helpful um, and systemic immunosuppressants, um, prednisolone in the short term, but mostly you want to start considering things like methotrexate, cyclosporine, and then moving on. If still um, refractory, you can then consider biologic agents, which specifically target um, certain interleukins um, associated with atopic dermatitis. Seborrheic dermatitis. Okay, so cradle cap is seborrheic so dermatitis of the scalp in babies, also known as dandruff in adults. So seborrheic so dermatitis is essentially a condition that affects the sebaceous glands, which are found on regions of the scalp, the face, the chest, and the back. Just think essentially the way I remember it is, where can you get acne and pimples? Those are your seborrheic regions. Um, it's been associated with a fungal yeast infection of Melisesia, which is typically normal flora, but in these patients, there's overgrowth um, and the body uh, develops an abnormal response to these yeast. It's typically a clinical diagnosis. Um, management, similar to atopic dermatitis, avoid triggers, use topicals, plus topical antifungals because you want to treat the fungal yeast. So they're things like imidazole, so uh, ketoconazole, shampoos, creams. Keratolytics, if you have a lot of scale, it can help lift up the scale and you can just wipe it off essentially. Um, and topical calcineurin inhibitors, I haven't seen it being used in practice, but I have read it on Dermnet. So that is a potential option for a steroid sparing agent. Um, adults, uh, it be begins in late adolescence because that's essentially when sebaceous glands mainly proliferate. Patients will present with oily skin, a family history leaning towards sebderm. Um, patients with previous treatment, particularly PUVA, so light therapy of psoriasis, has been associated with also presentations of sebdermatitis. And areas mostly affected will be the scalp, central face, around the ears, forehead and beard. In infants, cradle cap is the most common presentation of seborrheic dermatitis. And it's where there's a diffuse, greasy, brand-like scale over the scalp. It can spread to involve the armpit and groin, um, but it's usually asymptomatic. Moving on to contact uh, dermatitis. This is important for occupational medicine as well. Um, haha, so derm overlaps. So two main types, irritant contact dermatitis and allergic contact dermatitis. Starting with irritant, essentially this is a non-immune reaction to a toxic substance. The way to remember it is that irritant dermatitis can occur in anybody exposed to a particular substance once they've reached a threshold. So think about it like this. Anybody who's expo exposed to boiled water will get burnt, yeah? So then irritant contact dermatitis is similar in the fact that anybody exposed to a certain concentration and duration of a chemical will get this reaction. Um, Patients present with well demarcated erythematous patches with a slightly glazed surface. They can have blistering and swelling depending on what the irritant is, and they can also be associated with pain. Some examples are provided here that I've written up acids, alkalis, um, metal, uh, metal working fluids as well. Your management will be try to avoid the irritant or at least avoid reaching the threshold to which you have reactions. Um, Chemical burns, use the antidote against it, flush it with water. Um, overall compressions, creams and ointments that will help he the healing of the skin barrier. Antibiotics if you're worried about secondary infection. The main thing is you've just got to remove the irritant or prevent reaching that threshold. This brings us to allergic contact dermatitis. And this is different because it only occurs in people who are sensitized to the allergen. Okay, It doesn't matter about the concentration. It doesn't matter about the duration. It just matters about if the person is sensitive to that allergen. So it's a type four cell mediated delayed hypersensitivity reaction. Very, very common. It can arise some hours after exposure and it's 
at the first instance, it's usually confined to the area of exposure. But because it's an allergic reaction, your T cells become sensitized and T cells travel all around the body. The next exposures afterwards, you can have a reaction on any part of the skin because essentially your entire skin is now sensitized. So these reactions only happen in people who have been sensitized to an allergen or who are sensitive to this allergen at any concentration. Whereas irritant contact will happen in everybody at a certain concentration. I hope that difference makes sense. Um, some examples of allergic contact dermatitis or uh, allergens include jewelry, particularly nickel, uh, fragrances and perfumes, plants as well. Um, and your management will be, firstly, you can patch test to determine the specific allergen. You then want to advise the patient to avoid the allergen and any potential cross reactions that could trigger a similar reaction. Topical steroids over the areas and in the long term, you want a steroid sparing agent so you can use calcineurin inhibitors. Um, moving on to acne. So acne vulgaris, also known as common acne, is the most common skin condition essentially. About 80% of the population will experience acne sometime in their life. It's a chronic inflammatory condition of the pilosebaceous unit, so the hair and sebaceous gland follicle. And it's a special time of filicolitis. It can start at the age of eight, but it will typically appear in uh, the pubertal years and typically disappears by the age of 30. Interestingly, in adolescence, males are more commonly affected than females, but in early, early adulthood, females typically have more aggressive acne. There are four main steps in the pathophys that you should remember. Firstly, there's sebaceous gland hyperplasia and excess sebum production. And this makes sense and can explain why patients as young as eight can have acne because around the age of eight is when the adrenal glands start to produce androgens. Sebaceous glands respond to androgen production and therefore they produce more sebum. With excess sebum, your glands become blocked uh, and then you have bacterial colonization of the glands, the glands rupture, and because of this rupture, the body mounts a foreign body response, leading to the inflammation and redness of the acne. Um, your investigations, it's typically a clinical diagnosis, really, but you can screen for hyperandrogenic states such as PCOS and Cushing's um, to rule those out as well. Three main categories of acne, and this will also guide your management. Mild acne presents with non-inflammatory lesions such as comedomes. So they're just blocked pores, essentially. Blackheads have uh, an open head. So you can see the oxidization of the sebum. Whiteheads closed over. Moderate acne presents with more inflammatory lesions um, such as papules and pustules, um, can have some nodules and some mild scarring. Severe acne has a few definitions. Um, widespread inflammatory lesions, nodules, cysts with scarring, or moderate acne that hasn't resolved after six months of treatment, or acne of any severity with serious psychological impact. Um, your management will be based on the severity of the acne then. So in general, for everybody, you wanna minimize any medication that could be exacerbating this, such as anabolic steroids, you want to avoid touching it and squeezing the acne because it can lead to scarring. Use oil-free, non-comedogenic products and reduce foods high in uh, glycemic index. Specific to the subtypes, uh, the categories, sorry, mild acne for comedomal, if they don't have any papules or pustules, most of the time you can get away with just topical vitamin, vitamin A, so topical isotretinoid uh, or, or tretinoin. Um, you can also use topical benzoyl peroxide, which can be bought over the counter, and this is an antiseptic. Papular pustule acne, topical retinoids plus a topical antibiotic or salicylic acid cleansing agents. In moderate acne, you want to add on to the topical therapy oral antibiotics, so mainly the ones I've seen used are doxy and minocycline, or an antiandrogenic pill, particularly for females, so that would be an active agent of ciprotrone acetate. In severe cases, you can opt for iso isotretinoin, and this is the most effective acne treatment. It's curative in four out of five patients um, who have acne, and it can only be prescribed by a dermatologist. This is teratogenic, so females will typically be sent for pregnancy tests, 
and they are highly, highly recommended to have two uh, methods of contraception. When you start tretinoins, you must remember that it cannot be used with tetracycline. So if the patient has been on a tetracycline before going on the tretinoin, they must stop their tetracycline because the interaction between tretinoin and tetracycline is that there's been rare occurrences of benign intracranial hypertension. So just be aware of that. Um, moving on to psoriasis. So psoriasis is another chronic inflammatory condition of the skin, lots of different subtypes, but it is an immune mediated disease. Essentially, the way I remember it is psoriasis is when the skin speeds up its proliferation of keratinocytes and it causes thickening of the stratum corneum, which is why you see really thick plaques because the keratinocytes have been you know, proliferating so much. Um, bimodal epidemiology, but it has been associated with smoking and alcohol. So as part of your management, you want to uh, suggest SNAPs. Um, multifactorial uh, etiology, Investigations would typically be um, based off of clinical presentation, but you can biopsy psoriasis if you're trying to rule out other conditions. The clinical features in general are that they typically present as symmetrically distributed salmon pink or red scaly plaques with well-defined edges. Compared to eczema, which is found on flexural surfaces, psoriasis is on the extensor surfaces, such as the elbows and the kneecaps. Um, they can present on the scalp as well. Um, patients can present with itch and lichenification, which is thickened, leathery skin, accentuated skin markings. About 30% of patients will also have associated psoriatic arthritis, so you'll need to refer to rheumatology. Psoriasis has characteristic nail changes, and the acronym I used to remember this is DROPS. So dystrophy, ridging of the nails, onycholysis, which is where the uh, nail separates from the nail bed, starting distally, um, pitting of the nails and subungal keratosis, which is um, uh, excessive production of skin cells between the nails and the nail bed. It causes thickened nails and lifting up of the nails. These are the subtypes. Plaque psoriasis is the most common subtype, about 90% of all psoriasis mainly seen in the areas of the skin, most commonly in the elbows, knees, lower back, and scalp. Um, inverse so, oh, palmar plantar psoriasis is psoriasis of the palms and soles associated with people who smoke. Um, inverse or flexural psoriasis, as the name suggests, occurs uh, in the creases of the skin. And these are a bit trickier to determine, but they can look a little bit like candida, but the differentiating factor is that it's well-defined, little or no scale and no satellite lesions. Sartate psoriasis is an acute and rapid onset version of psoriasis characterized by widespread teardrop lesions, usually improving by itself, but some can transition to chronic plaque psoriasis. Most commonly you'll see guttate psoriasis in, in young adults two to three weeks after a strep infection. Pustular and erythrodermic psoriasis are your rarer subtypes and essentially hospitalize the patient because it means their entire skin is involved, which can lead to temperature dysregulations, uh, electrolyte imbalances, and cardiac failure. Management of psoriasis, lifestyle, avoid your triggers, um, snaps, moisturize, and then move on to topicals. So corticosteroids to help reduce the inflammation and mitotic rate of the keratinocytes. Your vitamin D analogs such as calcipotriol, which regulates the proliferation of the keratinocytes. Um, a certain medication called Davobet combines vitamin D analog with corticosteroids, and it's usually quite effective in the long term. Cold tar solutions are anti-inflammatory and anti-pruritic. Uh, they're very safe. They're very effective. They're just very, very sticky and stinky. So essentially, you apply the solution at night, you wash it off in the morning, and they can sting a little bit. Um, Diethanol cream inhibits keratinocyte hyperproliferation and the retinoids are anti-inflammatory and anti-proliferative. Patients with psoriasis can also um, be referred for UV therapy, which actually um, helps inhibit um, immune and inflammatory pathways. Systemic agents are your last line and you will start with methotrexate, cyclosporin or retinoids. If you fail any, or sorry, if you fail at least three of these, 
patients can then qualify for a PBS biologic agent. And biologic agents essentially target interleukin 11, uh, 17 um, to lower the immune system from triggering psoriasis. Moving on to rosacea. Uh, I'll quickly cover this because I want to move on and get to the, the um, exam questions. But essentially rosacea, chronic rash of the face, it's an acne-form skin disorder of the pilosebaceous units, very common in fair skin people of Caucasian origin, unknown etiology, but it has been associated with um, large colonizations of demodex bites. The risk factors I remember um, them to be as anything that heats up the body will flare up your rosacea. Spicy foods, hot temperature, exercise, stress, okay, these will all trigger rosacea. It's typically a clinical diagnosis. And let's go to this slide where we can talk through them. So clinically, you'll see a, a patient will present with transient uh, recurrent episodes of persistent erythema with telangiectasias. There can also be papules and pustules. And in rarer cases, you'll see lymphedematous um, involvement of the skin. In picture one, you see facial redness over the cheeks of a lady with prominent telangiectasias. Um, picture two, on top of that, you see papules and pustules on the face that look like acne. But the difference is only acne will have comedones. Okay, rosacea, you don't see any blackheads or whiteheads here. It's just papules and pustules. Picture three is of lymphedema and thickening of the nose. This is also called rhinophyma. So you see a, um, a bulbous nose and it has dilated pores and an orange peel skin. It mainly affects men, um, but this type of lymphedematous appearance can also occur on the chin, the nose and the ears as well. Picture four I've included because an interesting thing is that rosacea is associated with ocular involvement in about 50% of cases. So typically patients can also have blepharitis, conjunctivitis and episcleritis. Okay, um, that's why I've included that. Your management, avoid triggers, use um, topical therapy. So mild cases, you, you can have a six to 12 week course of topical antibiotics. Um, if they have lymphedematous involvement, refer them to a derm for laser. Consider systemic therapies if patients are not responding to the topicals. So that would be six to 12 weeks of an antibiotic um, and isotretinoin in severe cases. Skin infections. So I've summarized the main ones you should know and I've broken them down into their um, etiology. I'll probably skip over the bacterial ones because I'm sure you've heard of cellulitis and erysipelas in third year. Um, Empatigo has a classic honeycomb-like appearance, um, typically in school kids, not painful, and it has satellite lesions. This is the management. Cellulitis, I'll quickly skip over. Um, Frankas, I skip over and I start with viral warts. Viral warts, also known as Veruca vulgaris. Vulgaris just means common. Acne vulgaris, vulgaris psoriasis, just common. Um, this is, you're probably familiar with, HPV infected cells in the epidermis, causing them to grow and form a wart. They're more numerous and more persistent in people who are immunosuppressed. The general treatment is usually, um, most of them will disappear, but they're usually treated because they can cause discomfort, okay? The main things that you want to remember for treatment is occlusion, so keep the wood covered with a tape. It can potentially speed up resolution and prevent friction. Local destruction, so most commonly topical acids like salicylic acid. Electrosurgery, so um, curatage and cautery. Excision and laser removal has a high rate of recurrence and scarring though, so just warn patients of that. And topical cytotoxic and immunomodulatory therapies, such as pedophilin and miquimod, topical retinoids. You can also do intralesional um, bleomycin. So that's an intralesional chemotherapy to speed up regression. Lots of different types of warts. I'll let you read over that. I'll quickly jump to molluscum contagiosum. So this is a common viral skin infection, also known as water warts, most commonly seen in kids or anybody who shares towels, shares bath water, can be also sexually transmitted between adults. Um, and it presents as uh, these small, round, dome-shaped papules, as you can see. Um, they can 
be as large as, you know, three centimeters actually, but they're typically these size. They have a central dip, if you can see in the middle, a central umbilication um, and a pearly skin colored appearance. They can be itchy, particularly when they regress. Um, and treatment is usually not essential. They will resolve spontaneously. You really just want to prevent a transmission. So shower and don't take baths together. Don't share towels, get your own. Um, Pityriasis rosea. So this is a common self-limiting viral rash. Uh, has been associated with reactivation of herpes six and seven. And this is a very, very, very classic um, exam question because of its classic morphological presentation. So what happens is it starts up as a herald patch. So this is the first lesion you will ever see. And this is a large pinkish plaque or patch on the trunk of a patient's body. Typically has a scale around the collar, around the margins of the lesion. After a few weeks of having this patch, patients will then de develop an eruption of multiple smaller oval red scaly patches also with a collarette scale. These will be scattered over the trunk and they will be distributed along the skin tension lines. So it follows a Christmas tree-like pattern. So essentially when you um, squeeze your skin, what are the lines that follow? That's typically the way the rash will follow as well. Um, just be aware that if this happens in pregnancy, it can, it is associated with poor outcomes, um, such as miscarriages, which have been reported and premature deliveries. Um, management is that it self resolves. Uh, I think you all know herpes simplex virus and cold sores. And I think you also know chicken pox, which is varicella zoster and herpes zoster, which is shingles. So just have a read over these and I'll include additional notes in the post slides. These are the characteristic pictures of herpes zoster virus or shingles. And the clinical features are that it presents along a dermal tomal distribution. Severe pain, typically prior to the eruption of these lesions. And it presents as a blistering rash one to three days of onset with pain, dermatomal distribution, usually vesicles first that transition into pustules, they slough and erode into crusted lesions. Fungal skin infections, the main one to remember is tinea. And tinea is just a dermatophytic or fungal infection of the hair, skin and nails. Depending on the body part affected, it has a different name. Um, but essentially the clinical features are they will typically present as annular, so circular eruptions with an irregular edge and a central clearing. I'll show you in the next slide. You wanna do scrapings for MCS because you want to actually diagnose dermatophytes on path. You need that diagnosis to be confirmed before patients are actually allowed a PBS subscription of tabinafine. Prior to that, they will either pay out of pocket or they can use topical only. If, it's, if you have tinea of the nails, you will need to actually get them a PO system, a PO anti, PO, sorry, PO antifungal because topical will not penetrate the nail matrix. Uh, these are the subtypes. I'll leave it for you to go over because I know we're running out of time and I want to get to other things. So pyrosis vesicular is a yeast infection, previously called tinea uh, vesicular, but it actually has no association with any fungal infections at all. Uh, essentially uh, it's due to a skin reaction of the normal occurring yeast, Malassezia furfur, which you'll recall is also associated with seborrheic dermatitis. Um, patients present asymptomatically with discolored patches. It can either be hyperpigmented, as in slightly darker in people of fair skin, or hypopigmented in people of darker skin. They have typically affecting the trunk downwards, uh, sorry, neck downwards, so mainly the trunk. And your investigations will usually be clinical diagnosis, or you can also use a Woods lamp, which is a UV light examination. And what you'll see is it will pick up the yellowish uh, fluorescence color of the yeast. Management, um, only if the rash is super concerning, you can use topical um, antifungals. So imidazole lotions and creams. Um, for extensive, extensive ones, you can use PO antifungal. Scabies is the main infestation to remember. It's because of Sarcoptes scabii. The main clinical things to remember are that they can spread from person to person. 
um, highly, highly contagious. The main signs are that it's extremely itchy, particularly at night, usually doesn't affect the face, mainly found in the webs, palms, uh, genitals, and soles. Um, what you want to do is take skin scrapings for potassium hydroxide wet mount prep. And what you want to find is either the scabies burrow, poo, or actual scabies to confirm diagnosis. Your management is very simple. Permethrin 5% is your first sign. You apply it to your entire body before going to bed. You sleep with it and you wash it up in the morning. Remove all your clothing and linen, wash that in hot water and repeat all of this in one week. Um, hair, I have written this slide just out of interest in case you want to read up on it. I won't cover it right now. Trichotillomania is a condition that overlaps with psych. It's a psychiatric disorder. Um, so read over that. And let's quickly go over some Pete's rush before doing some exam questions. So measles, due to the measles virus, just remember these, like they're so easily buzzwordy for either Peds or Derm GP, and they almost always come up. Um, so for measles, it's a blanching, meaning it turns white, macular papula, flat or papule rash, appearing three to four days after chorizal symptoms, and it starts behind the ear and then progresses down. Erythema infectiosum is parvovirus B19, characterized by uh, slapped cheeks and a reticular rash on the body, meaning a net-like appearance. Um, Roseola infantum is uh, human herpes virus 6, sudden high fever. After the fever subsides, that's when you uh, notice generalized blanching macular papular rash that spares the face. Rubella is due to the rubella virus, mild prodromal phase, macular papular rash, and this is self-limiting. So the question will typically say it resolves by itself. Hand, foot, mouth, um, typically seen in kids. Uh, first sign could be that kids stop eating and drinking because of these lesions in their mouth. Their papular vesica, vesicular lesions on the hands, foot, mouth associated with fevers. Um, blisters should not be ruptured um, and this prevents transmission. You just wanna keep them clean, keep the kids out of the schools until all the blisters have crusted over and dried. Scarlet fever due to group A strep um, presents with strawberry tongue, a sandpaper rash and a strep throat. Miscellaneous, uh, bullous pemphigoid it will be important for also your path exam. I will leave this for you to read so that we can move on to exam questions. Sorry to eat into your lunch break just for a little bit. Um, dermatomyositis is an important one to remember just because of its characteristic features. So it's a very, very easy question. They just have to pick up on all the signs. Um, essentially, first picture you see Gottron's papules and it happens over the articular joints of a patient's hands. Raynaud's phenomenon, a heliotrope rash which occurs around the orbits and the eyelids and the shawl sign, which is a widespread flat uh, reddened area that appears on the upper back of a patient. Dermatomyositis is associated with, um, it's a photosensitive condition, so it worsens in exposure to UV um, radiation. Also associated with chronic muscle inflammation, it's a mixture of connected tissue and derm disease. SLE is another chronic multi-system autoimmune disease. Um, there is a criteria that you should remember. Essentially, this is what a mellow rash looks like or a butterfly rash. This is photosensitive rash because SLE is photosensitive. Um, and patients also present with arthritis, oral ulcers, discoid rash, round rash, and changes in their bloods. Okay, questions, yay. Some of these stuff I haven't talked about, but I thought it would be best to just go through them and see if you can guess them. So um, just type in your answers into the chat. These are previous questions and they're the exact pictures actually. So. Can anybody guess what this might be? I, yes. Yes, Samuel Robinson, that is correct. So this is a pyogenic granuloma and I only briefly, briefly mentioned it, but I thought this would be the better way to learn it. It's an acquired benign proliferation of your capillary blood vessels 
Um, it's associated with patients who are on the pill, uh, who are pregnant, and it's usually triggered by minor trauma. And the buzzwords consistently have been, they've pricked themselves on a rose bush thorn. It presents as a painless, um, red, fleshy nodule. It grows rapidly over a few weeks. The surface is initially smooth, but it can ulcerate. They're usually solitary. Um, the most common sites are the fingers because that's where you typically have minor trauma. Um, they can bleed easily, they can bleed easily um, but they will usually self-resolve. If patients are super worried or it bleeds a lot, you can just cauterize it though. Good job. Next question. Close. Um, so good guesses here. It's actually a neurofibroma. Let me explain why. So it's not a viral wart because typically viral warts have a verrucous top, meaning it has sort of, it's sort of like, you know, your stomach lining has rugae and it has up and down, up and down. That's typically what warts have. And warts will be less uniformly dome shaped and less erythematous like this. It is not molluscum contagiosum. Anything viral, think of something that presents as clusters. So if it's a single solitary nodule, it's less likely going to be an infection. Um, this is a neurofibroma and it's a solitary neurofibroma, which presents as a, um, why not dermatofibroma? Yeah, I'll cover that in a second. Um, so it's a neurofibroma because it presents as a solitary um, skin colored soft firm papule essentially. And when you squeeze it, it will have what's known as a buttonhole invagination, meaning it has a little dimple sign. It's usually seen in young women. And um, these are distinguished from neurofibromatosis because this patient doesn't have um, anything else. It's a single nodule. And in patients with neurofibromatosis, you'll also have multiple neurofibromas cafe au lait macules and Chagrin's patch. This is not a dermatofibroma um, because dermatofibromas can grow a little bit more compared to neurofibromas. And this one doesn't seem to have changed in size would be my reasoning. Um, uh, what about this one? This one's a little tricky. I had the luxury of actually having the answers and then working backwards. Um, <laughs> and then explaining. So let's see what you guys uh, get. Hopefully the picture's clear enough. We have an M, we have a C. Yes, yeah, so you guys are on the right track. Um, uh, it's not a pyogenic granuloma. Okay, good. We've got a few answers in RL. Yeah, right, right. So this is actually, I, I'm glad that you guys are on the SCC spectrum. Now, how do we differentiate? So this is actually, according to the answers, a Bowen's disease. And when I've thought about it, so it's not an actinic keratosis because it's been growing um, and has been so it's been gradually enlarging. Actinic keratosis typically don't enlarge unless they've transitioned to something more um, concerning such as Bowen's. And it's been present for over a year, so it hasn't spontaneously resolved. It's well demarcated, which is the clue that it's probably less likely going to be actually S6C um, invasive. Um, both Bowen's and invasive SECs can have an irregular border, but the main thing is that it has well demarcated edges most likely then leaning towards uh, Bowen's. The surface of the lesion is scaling, scratching is painful and comfortable. That can present with AKs, Bowen's or SCCs. Your main clues would have been well demarcated, growing on the sun exposed area. So you were all on the right track. It, it was still a hard question. I was just lucky that I got the answers and could justify it working backwards. Um, uh, let's try this question now. Yes, yes. So this is what I'm talking about. This is like 
characteristic presentation of Pityriasis rosea. You have your herald patch, which presents first. Don't forget, you can actually have multiple herald patches. It's usually solitary one. The patients can present with two or three um, herald patches. And then a few weeks later, eruption along the um, skin fold lines with a collaret scale. Very, very good. Uh, let's try this one. Good. Yes, yes, so we've got two M's. Yes, good, you're good. It is pyrosis vesicular. Very, very common presentation. Asymptomatic um, on the trunk of a patient usually spares the head and neck. It's been there for a while. Doesn't really cause him any, any problems. It's typically just going to be pyrosis vesicular. And this is a characteristic presentation of a person with fairer skin. They have, um, a, slightly hyperpigmented slash erythematous patches over the trunk. Good. This one might be a little bit tricky. So just give him a go. Got D. Okay, I might just give the answer away. This is actually tuberous sclerosis. I've totally forgotten my other conditions that I knew in fourth year, such as Charcot Marie Tooth, but I can justify why this is tuberous sclerosis. So, um, tuberous sclerosis is an autosomal dominant condition um, characterized by hematomas, which are proliferations and overgrowth of the skin tissue. Um, tuberous sclerosis has a triad that you should remember. Essentially, you present with hypopigmented spots, also known as ash leaf spots. You, patients present with mental retardation or developmental delays, and they also present with seizures. So this patient has all three of the triad, and that was what gave the answer away. So ash leaf spots, um, mental retardation slash developmental delays or behavioral problems, and epileptic seizures. Um, and as my final slide, these are what ash leaf spots look like and you typically see them over the lower back of patients, um, posteriorly. And that was it.